Josh, the gaming industry is very stupid in 2024. <laughs> is that right? They've never made any mistakes in the past, have they? No, I feel, but the thing is, I feel like in general, most people have a, oh my God, modern gaming feeling when uh, the majority of news stories come out. As we're recording this, Power World's the biggest thing in the world. Huh? And this time last week, most people hadn't even heard of it. I still haven't heard of it. Well, I have, <laughs> but I don't know what it is. We thought, why not take the opportunity to capitalize on all the most ridiculous times gaming has been modern gaming. And shout out to Paul McSoul over on social media for suggesting this as well, because I'm Scott. I'm Josh. And this is 10 times great franchises did something really stupid. Number 10, charging for New Game Plus, Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth. This is the one that inspired the whole list. Um, and at the time of recording, uh, Sega slash Ryo Gagatoku Studio haven't walked this back. And the idea being that the new Like a Dragon game, Infinite Wealth, has its New Game Plus mode tied behind premium currency. It's inside a DLC called the Master Vocation DLC Bundle. You get that with the Deluxe Edition or the there's another Super Edition that's like even more money. But like I said, at time of recording, we don't know how many like, achievements or trophies are tied to this thing. But the fact that New Game Plus is being charged for is uh, the first time the franchise has done it and a, a completely negative response um, online. It absolutely sucks when one of the good ones does something <laughs> like this, you know what I mean? A lot of the picks that I've got to come are from, you know, repeat offenders, publishers that you would expect to make huge mistakes, but seeing this attached to mm. a franchise as beloved as Like a Dragon, that's a shame. And then it's like, I just kind of see the money grubby side of it and I see Sega going like, what can we do? Mm. We can't put a battle pass in it. We can't necessarily do a bunch of microtransactions. No one's tried monetizing New Game Plus yet. I guess we'll do that. Admittedly, I think you see a lot of publishers with single player focused franchises do stuff like this. For instance, mm. my beloved Resident Evil is kind of weirdly stuffed with microtransactions. You can buy, <laughs> um, you know, upgrades for your weapons. You can buy a lot of different skins and it is an interesting way for these publishers to try to monetize a single player game without doing exactly what you said, like throwing in a battle pass because yeah. you can't do that. But when you're segmenting what I would refer to as a, a standard feature like this, that sucks. Like yeah. this kind of um, feature should come as the norm, if not at launch, then certainly in a post-launch update, kind of like how uh, Sony deals with um, New Game Plus sometimes. Yeah, I'll be interested to see if they walk it back after launch because of just how ludicrously huge PAL World is right now. It's kind of just dominating the discourse in every possible regard. Last of Us 2 Remastered barely stood a chance on its la own launch weekend. My beloved Prince of Persia, I where even is that right where now? Where is it? Why are you playing PAL World over <laughs> Prince of Persia? <laughs> Pop World is what I want to be in. <laughs> but still, we'll see how things go uh, post-launch. Like I said, at the time of recording, the New Game Plus mode is still being charged for. Number nine, Modern Warfare Remastered has held hostage behind Infinite Warfare. Scott Tilford, <laughs> in the previous entry, I said that most of mine are going to be repeat offenders and publishers you'd expect to do money grubby things. Mm. Well, when it comes to Modern Warfare Remastered, Activision didn't just do one money grubby thing. They did like three, right? <laughs> so if you don't recall, Modern Warfare Remastered is a remaster of the original Call of Duty 4. It was made by Raven Software and they did a great job. Like mm. that game, is amazing. It's a real stellar upgrade on the original. It, it you know plays the nostalgia card. It has the multiplayer bundled in with it in a way that Modern Warfare 2 Remastered did not. It's a great standalone game. The issue is Activision didn't release it as a standalone game. They <laughs> held it hostage behind the, I think it was called Legacy Edition yes. of Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, which um, was obviously like the premium version of that game. And you could only play COD 4 if you ponied up the money for that expensive version. Now, bear in mind, Infinite Warfare, when that was announced, was initially panned by fans who absolutely downvoted the reveal trailer to Oblivion online, and mm -hmm. people were just sick at that time of futuristic Call of Duty. So they were already not interested in Infinite Warfare. Mm. And then when a game they actually were interested in was locked behind buying it, that just soured them on it even more. I'm sure someone in the Activision boardroom was thinking, look, Infinite Warfare doesn't have the best response, but people love COD 4. If we just bundle them together, <laughs> then we'll synergize the franchise and people will love Infinite Warfare. That didn't happen. No. People turned on COD 4 as much as they did Infinite Warfare, and it meant that once again, a good game that developers poured their heart and soul into was absolutely kneecapped by the decisions 
of Activision Blizzard. And yeah, it just felt like after that initial response to the trailer, they were like, how the hell do we get people back on board? Yeah. We'll put one of the most beloved installments alongside it. And as far as I know, it took them months, if they ever did it, to let you buy the remake of Modern Warfare properly. I think it was literally years, yeah. like more than just a couple of months. You can buy it standalone now, thankfully. But Activision, yet again, couldn't leave well enough alone. They had to monetize the hell out of it to probably make up for the money they thought they were going to lose on Infinite Warfare. So suddenly, Codfo's beloved simplistic multiplayer, it had viable skins. It had a bunch of fluff that wasn't in there originally. Mm -hmm. And as a final point, do you know how... Most times when you get a remake or a remaster, it's a complete edition. You know, you get all of the DLC, you get all of the add-ons. It's the definitive version, to steal a term from Rockstar, yes. of that game. This wasn't. Not only was the game itself locked behind a paywall of Infinite Warfare, but it didn't even come with the original DLC map pack that <laughs> was released what? for Modern Warfare way back when. So you had to buy Infinite Warfare to buy Modern Warfare, and then when you were finally in, you had to pay an extra $15 to buy the map pack that was like 14 years old My or 10 brain years has old. erased this. I remember the whole Modern Warfare thing. I didn't realize they double, they double dipped on the double dip. It's outrageous. Yeah, they, they quadrupled <laughs> dipped. <laughs> Number eight, Joker is back again. Again? Sui <laughs> Suicide Squad kill the Justice League. Yeah, this is something that is just breaking as we're recording this, and I thought I'd throw it in because Suicide Squad kill the Justice League is in the Arkhamverse. So the overall uh, great franchise is obviously the, the legacy of the Arkham games, but that doesn't seem to matter at all mm. to the way Suicide Squad's rolling out. And obviously we're pre-launch. This game could be incredible. The uh, playing as Joker could be incredible, but the response um, you know, across the last sort of 24-ish hours since the gameplay reveal dropped is kind kind of just pointing and laughing. Like, it's not that the new design for Joker wouldn't have worked at all. I quite like Rocksteady saying that they've, they're have they channeling sort of the vaudevillian roots of the character and this idea of him being more of a showman. That thing's cool. It's just that you've divorced yourself so much from anything close to thematic resonance or meaning or whatever character arcs that were in the Arkham trilogy. Um, and Joker's just back again. Now, the uh, conceit is that it's some sort of multiversal style reveal. At least that's my interpretation of the way that they're doing it because it's such a different version of him. But I feel like um, trying to lead the marketing at this point so close to launch by saying, hey, by the way, Joker's in it. Kind of reminds me of what they did with Suicide Squad in 2016. And I'll mm. be amazed if this turns people around because the general conversation on Suicide Squad is just so thermonuclear negative right now anyway. But I guess we'll see. Um, you're never going to know until it launches. I just, the way this thing's rolling out, it just seems fascinating. Like not to mention Power World every three seconds, <laughs> but it's ludicrous how much Power World has already outsold what I imagine will be Suicide Squad's final numbers. That reality of gaming is just ridiculous. It's stressful. That's the real Elseworlds. <laughs> Number seven, Ghost Recon Frontline is a live service disaster. Scott, I've just gone through Activision's big blunder with Modern Warfare, but Ubisoft over the past few years creatively have been putting their foot in it one step after <laughs> the other. And perhaps the most mismanaged franchise that they have is Ghost Recon. Yeah. They kind of hit gold with Ghost Recon Wildlands, which was a reinvention of the franchise. It, you know, was janky. It wasn't as polished as it could be, but it kind of set the template, for me at least, of what what the franchise could be going forward. Mm -hmm. Then we got Ghost Recon Breakpoint, which was more of the same, but more broken. You had John Bernthal in there, but mm -hmm. even he wasn't enough to patch over the massive holes in that game. And that was not well received in part because of just how buggy it was, but also because of how iterative it was and mm -hmm. how kind of uninspired it was. So Ubisoft's grand plan for the franchise wasn't to, you know, double down on the franchise's roots. It was to announce a new game, Ghost Recon Frontline. I forgot this happened. Which was a live service first person multiplayer shooter. In fact, I popped silly earlier as I quickly Wikipedia <laughs> it because Wiki actually describes it as, and I quote, a live service first person massively multiplayer online PvP class based tactical shooter <laughs> battle royale game. <laughs> so that's like literally every buzzword that you could possibly get in that's just, to a game's description. Yeah, right? that's the AI overlords kicking into gear. That's where it started. We yeah. never knew the actual origin story. That's the beginning of it. That's Ubisoft just saying, right, what if we had the every game yeah. and we use Ghost Recon's name to sell it? So this was announced and immediately people were like, 
stop doing this. We know you want to chase the money. We know you want a live service game, but why does it have to be Ghost Recon? Yeah. Invent something new. Stop changing and transforming your known IP um, into, you know, kind of like these potential cash cows. You mm -hmm. can't just treat these franchises like this. Um, there was a huge backlash. Uh, the trailers were downvoted massively. And then a year later, Ubisoft just went, you know what? Fair enough. We'll cancel it outright. So at least this kind of, it doesn't have a happy ending for the people working on the game, no. but at least they didn't go ahead with a concept that was rejected off the bat. And hopefully, fingers crossed, we will eventually get a new Ghost Recon game that isn't this and is playing to the series' of strengths and yes. does the franchise justice, kind of like in a way that the new Prince of Persia game does. Number six, not knowing the game you have is broken, Halo Infinite. I just, every now and then I'll think back on this and just be like, <laughs> what, what, what were you guys doing over there? In regards to, I, I looked up the um, the timeline for this. The Halo Infinite Craig trailer was in July, wow. um, back in uh, 2020. That was when we first saw the first look at Halo's camp, Halo Infinite's campaign. And a lot of people went, what the living hell is this? And then it wasn't until, because um, then the game was meant to come out in holiday 2020, which wasn't a specific month, but it was like late 2020. The whole idea being that this would be, you know, the tip of the spear for the Halo, for the Xbox series systems and the tip of the spear for Halo going forward. Um, and then it was delayed in August for a whole year. And so I get to some degree, the reality of game development, the reality of the likes of Phil Spencer and the people at the top, not wanting to be, you know, their faces pushed against the glass for every game that's being made, making sure it's, you know, ticking along just fine. But at the same time, I can't, I can't believe in a wider sense the state of Halo. Halo Infinite's finally good now, but it took like three, almost four years for it to get to this point where it's genuinely recommendable. The Master Chief Collection took four years to get sorted, and then Halo Infinite in the run-up to the launch of it was just an absolute fire. Yeah. And then uh, you had all the Craig memes because of the state of the um, one of the brute's faces and everything. And so every now and then I'll just think back on that and be like, how did you guys not know what state this was in until only a couple of months before it was meant to launch and how are you not or how were they not more on it in regards to the quality, the level of quality that was supposed to be there. What's crazy to me is that they, of course, like you said, delayed that game a year anyway. Mm. And then features were still delayed after that. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, the game came out in a solid enough state. I know people really enjoyed the multiplayer, but that first season of the multiplayer actually was it was like six months or something, wasn't yeah. it? Until they had a next Oh, next the original contract. Battle Pass was drop. terrible as well. Yeah, 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 the next content drop, sorry. Mm. Um, and obviously they delayed Forge mode for a few months, the co-op, split-screen co-op mode that they promised for the campaign. I don't know if that even ever arrived. I think they might have canceled that outright. I think that eventually did. And I remember the scene, I've seen a lot of, like, the thing is I play Halo Infinite a lot, but it's only yeah. the multi, I go straight to the multiplayer mode, give me Team Slayer, whatever. Yeah, they did do a lot of Forge stuff. They'd, I'm sure they did add in the co-op eventually, but the point that the, Overall point is that it took far too long for those features to come in. It just, it's an absolute, or it was at least an absolute fire. Well, I look forward to when Halo comes back as a first person, massively multiplayer, <laughs> online PVP, class-based tactical shooter battle royale game. And that's, that's the, the last time I'll make that joke. That's the secret weapon. That's maybe what <laughs> Pal World's gonna be by the time we're done with it, but we'll see. Number five, canceling GTA 5's single player DLC. Scott, that I think we one. always knew that at some point there must have been some single player DLC mm. planned for GTA. Five, but of course, online just absolutely blew up and became the biggest thing in the universe, started raking in billions of dollars every other month and seemingly scuppered those plans. But we didn't really know what those plans were until very recently, thanks to at least a report over on Insider Gaming, mm -hmm. which looked into the leaks and these seemed pretty legit. And they suggested um, through these leaks that there were apparently at least eight DLC packs in the works for Grand Theft Auto V. Eight now, of them. Not all of these were, you know, massive expansions on the level of the Ballad of Gay Tony or the other one from GTA 4 that was really good, the Lost Ooh. and Damned, I think. Yeah, Lost and Damned. But it does seem that at least a few of those would have hit that level. There are two that stuck out in particular. One just titled Prologue DLC and another one titled Liberty 5 DLC. Okay. Now, from Insider Gaming's reporting and just kind of intuition, you can kind of assume that the Prologue DLC would take place before the start of Grand Theft Auto V. <laughs> and if you recall, in the prologue of that game, you already play as a younger version of Michael and Trevor, but you don't really know who those characters are at the time, pulling their final job before mm -hmm. Michael um, goes into witness protection. And that would have been really cool, in my opinion, because yeah. Michael and Trevor's relationship, having played through GTA V again recently, is so fascinating. And, and all the way through, 
through that game when I was playing it again, I was thinking, how were these two people like ever friends? How did they meet? <laughs> like, how did they, you know, what was their relationship yeah. before all of this? It's so fascinating. It's so weird. They're such an odd couple that I would have liked to have seen younger versions of those characters and kind of where they were properly before that game started. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Liberty 5 DLC seems to suggest that we were going to re be returning to Liberty City mm -hmm. in some form. And that is a tantalizing prospect in something I was trying to will into existence. But we haven't seen Liberty City since Grand Theft Auto 4. Mm -hmm. And I would love to see a next gen take on that. At this point, whether it was single player DLC or whether it was just an online map, I want to see it back. I feel like Rockstar um, have this thing where they sort of want to want to reuse or revisit certain landmasses. Like in Red Dead Redemption 2, Red Dead 1's map is just kind of there. Like as if they were going to do something with it at some point. And then like you said, and Strauss Zelnick, obviously take two, Strauss Zelnick, the parent company of Rockstar, has talked so much about GTA Online, blew up to such a degree that all the focus just became on GTA Online. Obviously it's a choice at some point. You make more money than most of the world. But at some point they just decided to keep making GTA Online uh, DLC packs and everything. But it's a shame. Like GTA 5's protagonists are some of the most lovable in the entire series. And it always made sense to do a bit more of that. Like almost every one of them, especially Stephen Ogg and his acting roles and everything, yeah. they all became little mini celebrities anyway. Um, and it was always just an open goal. Like not everyone who loves GTA loves GTA Online. I'm very much one of those people. I only really care about the offline story stuff. And it would have been, it would have just made the most sense to do that. And now it's been 11 years and we're never going to get it. Hard agree, man. I think it's an absolute travesty. I hope that in whatever form it may be, I get to spend more time with these characters. Because again, mm. going back to it, I realize how much I love them all. You know, Franklin, Trevor, Michael, I think they're all so fascinating in their own way. I love their dynamics. I love the way that they're performed, especially like you said, Stephen Ogg's mm -hmm. Trevor. And it would be a shame to just only have one game with them because it seems like there's so much bloody potential there. <laughs> Number four, Mother Base Coins, Metal Gear Solid Five. Ugh. I know, horrible. I remember Metal Gear Solid Five very fondly, but that's mainly because I didn't interact with the forward operating base stuff. I didn't, op I didn't interact with the microtransaction side of it. And the thing that was really bad with the Mother Base Coins in Metal Gear Solid Five, they were meant to be used to just sort of maintain this online base that you would have. You'd be able to invade other players' bases. And the game released in September. However, only a month later, I remember the controversy around this, and it was just Konami. I am patching the game in October after they'd received positive press, they'd received all these positive review scores and everything, it was a month after launch, that they put a patch out that let you start buying um, insurance for your base and time skips, and you had to pay for an additional slot if you wanted to build more than one mother base, and it was eight pound uh, for an additional mother base, and they, you know, they had all these microtransactions in there anyway, but like that idea of capitalizing on positive press and then cashing in on it afterwards and not necessarily having the game be re-reviewed by all the major outlets, so you get to have your marketing, say nine out of 10, 10 out of 10, all these great systems. Oh, I actually love the mother base stuff. It surprisingly doesn't ask me to pay for stuff <laughs> or whatever it is. And then cashing in on that later on was at the time peak Konami and, uh, and why that F Konami hashtag did the rounds for so long because this is one of the worst examples of it. Um, and obviously there was a lot of reasons why Metal Gear Solid went away for so long. Like we're about to get the Metal Gear Solid 3 remake at the minute, but still decisions like this just drove it into the ground. And Metal, Metal Gear 5 was such a weirdly received game anyway. I absolutely loved it. And I loved the twist at the end. I liked the whole idea that we as a character being created are actually fundamental to the entire canon. I always liked that stuff. But still, the mother base stuff, the, the amount of coins and the idea of having repeat microtransactions in a Metal Gear game was alien AF to the whole thing. And I wanted to also throw in, just in regards to Pete Konami, was uh, when they finally brought Metal Gear back and they did Metal Gear Survive, I forget the year, but they charged for save slots in that yeah. game. Which was just, a, can you just not? Like, we don't, <laughs> it didn't work before, it's not going to work again. I don't know what your memories of it, Metal Gear 5 are, but everything in regards to the mother base stuff, I built one. Yeah. I invaded a couple of people's and I was like, this just is isn't Metal Gear to me. Yes, I agree. You know, I, I like that it was there, but once it started getting complicated and once they started adding those microtransactions mm. in and were clearly leaning on it, that's when I sort of just completely bailed on it. And I don't know why publishers were so arrogant around that period to do exactly what you were describing, where they would release a game, mm. get all of these plaudits for it being microtransaction free and not nickel and diming you. And then like two months <laughs> later, release a patch that implements all of that nefarious stuff. Yeah. It got them backlash anyway maybe even got them more backlash because they were trying to be sneaky about it. <laughs> and you can't just slip that under the radar because people will end up reporting on it and you will end up eating your hat over mm -hmm. the mistakes that you've made. And yeah, it sucked to see that happen to Metal Gear, especially, of course, 
with everything that happened with Konami and Kojima, Hideo Kojima, and to just see sort of him taken off the project, mm. him exit Konami, the game come out in a clearly unfinished state, even though I really loved it, and then to see Konami pretty much just kick that dead horse and try to get as much money out of it as possible now that the creator had left was just... It left an icky taste in my mouth um, from what was an otherwise, you know, incredible game. Mm -hmm. Number three, Alan Wake 2's digital only release. Scott Telford, you and I just recorded a podcast yesterday at the time of recording this video. Go on subscribe our to the What Culture Gaming Podcast. Of the year. Please go subscribe and listen to us talk about how much we enjoyed Alan Wake 2. You mm -hmm. know, it got so much critical praise when it came out last year, and this was a long overdue sequel. Fans have been clamoring for an Alan Wake 2 for literally a decade. And it kind of seemed like we were never going to get it. You know, initially Microsoft um, had their fingers in the IP. Remedy moved on to make games like Control and it just didn't look like it was going to happen. Mm. So when it was announced, everyone was very excited. And then when the reviews came out, I think everyone was doubly excited because they didn't realize that it was going to be that good. Mm -hmm. The issue is the publisher of the game, Epic Games, decided for whatever reason to only release this game on digital storefronts. There was no physical release. And while there's no necessary confirmation of this, I have to imagine that contributed in a big way to Alan Wake 2 seemingly underperforming. Oh, yeah. The last report I read from December indicated that it had only sold 900,000 copies on console, which right. if this was a smaller game would be fine. But you know, it being a big remedy release and getting all of those great game of the year nods. The fact that it's only sold that much just seems baffling to me. Mm -hmm. And you you only have to look online. You only had to look on the subreddit at the time to see people saying, well, it's a digital only release. I'm not going to buy it. But even outside of that, I think just releasing something like this of this caliber on digital storefronts robs it of like visibility. You yeah. know, I know fewer people probably do this than ever, but walking into a game shop or even like looking at the physical releases on Amazon or whatever, you know, not to see that, not to ha not to sell it physically and not to get it out there in that way, I think was just a huge mistake. I don't know why you would do this and it does feel like this is going to become a trend. Mm -hmm. The upcoming Hellblade sequel, Senua's Sacra Saga? The one that isn't the first one. Hellblade 2 yeah. is coming out, and that's also digital <laughs> only. So, and we're obviously getting a bunch of physical games that release with a disc, but it's, you know, it's just a code to download the oh, game. And it, that, we're in yeah. a weird position with physical releases right now, is what I'm trying to say. And it's yeah, such that Alan Wake 2 seems to have bared the brunt of the kind of backlash to it. Number two, ditching the main way people are playing your game. Pokemon Go. <laughs> Remember Pokemon Go? What a lovely time what it was. What a lovely little time. It's been eight years since Pokemon Go. It's not a lovely little thing at all. Don't but remind me. No, but it's at the same time, that was one hell of a summer. And I didn't realize that when you look at the specific dates for this, Pokemon Go launched in July 2016. There was a... Uh, like a weird like ROM version you could get earlier. I remember downloading it on my Android at the time, even though the official launch wasn't out yet. I didn't do anything illegal. <laughs> it was it sounds like you did something illegal. It was available on the Niantic website or some sort of official website. My point is it dropped overall in July and that particular summer was the time that the whole world was responding to it. Videos of everybody chasing Charizards through Central Park. It was a lovely, lovely time. I very much uh, side with the people who say it was the closest we ever came to world peace because <laughs> it was incredible. But I didn't realize that um, the specific time that they rolled out the patch that killed the game was only in August. We only really got one beautiful month where um, it was in August where Niantic had to do a patch that removed the nearby feature that was in the game. And at the time, there was a whole thing about trying to track down the best Pokemon in the game. Obviously, the likes of Charizard and other, you know, three-stage evolutions, big Pokemon um, would be very, very rare. They would only spawn a couple of times a day. And you had to use the nearby feature inside the app to see where that was going to be based on the amount of footprints that were underneath the, um, the picture of the Pokemon itself. Um, and because of that, uh, within the app, there was various like, you know, geotagged data that a lot of people then extracted and made online maps that would show you exactly where something was going to be and at exactly what time. And you can argue back and forth on how much that broke the experience of playing the game. John Hankey, who's the CEO, can't say Hankey without laughing, and um, the CEO of uh, Niantic um, got out there and said, look, this isn't really the way that we wanted people to play the game. So, but instead of 
you know, off offering an alternative or waiting until you had an alternative, they just removed the nearby feature altogether. So you couldn't see where anything was and you just had to wander around aimlessly and hope that you ran into a Pokemon that you wanted. And a lot of things, you know, you can point to a lot of things that maybe made Pokemon Go get too big too fast. Maybe people then wanted to bounce off it. It was just so omnipresent. But I like to think, or at least I do think, that it was this specific removal that mm. killed the game. Like Pokemon Go kept going. There were Go Fests every year. And I certainly kept playing it for a long time. But that overall rush of, oh my God, it's everywhere. And um, that went away as soon as they took away the nearby feature because they fundamentally removed the way you played the game. And they didn't have a fix for like another year or so because they had to rethink the way the app was built to get rid of all the geotag stuff and everything else in regards to which data you could extract. And by the time they had it fixed, that fan base had like tenthed. Like it was nowhere near what it was when it first launched. You know, I have nothing to add to this point because you've <laughs> made every point there perfectly. But I will say that Pokemon Go was the first gaming recommendation you ever gave me, Scott Telford. Was it? That summer, I was in what culture uh, on work placement for like two <laughs> weeks. First time we'd ever met in person. And you said, you got to get Pokemon Go. Put your laptop away, mate. Put, you got Pokemon Go. Exactly. And I said, well, uh, no, I don't play mobile games. And two, I don't even like Pokemon that much. And you were like, doesn't matter. Get it. You're not getting the job Pokemon. unless you do this. And because of you, I did get it, had some lovely lunch times with yourself, but also that provided me a gateway drug into microtransactions. Ooh. The first microtransaction I ever bought was to buy more Pokeballs. Really? So what I'm saying is it's all your fault that I'm now <laughs> buying Call of Duty Warzone skins. Look, I bought a little jacket in Pokemon Go, but I didn't do it for years. I just, after a while, I was like, I'm gonna have to give something back to this because it was free. It is free for the longest time. And it was only a few years in where I was like, I should probably give them some money. And I dropped like three English pounds on a, on a little black jacket. So I could <laughs> look a bit more fly. But yeah, that was, that was a hell of a time though. The fact that it punched through and got you playing as well. Um, yeah, we had some lovely little raids chasing all the little Vaporeons around. Lovely summer. Number one, Battlefront 2 cancelling support in favour of Battlefield 2042. Ooh. Man, you know, Star Wars Battlefront 2, it had a rocky launch to say the least. And it would have been easy to just throw that on here. But we've mm -hmm. talked about it being the kind of peak of loot boxes and live service game design many times before. I want to talk about the good things about Star Wars <laughs> Battlefront 2. Because that game, by the end of its lifespan, was in an incredible yeah. shape. EA and DICE, to their credit, after that disastrous launch did put in the graft to turn things around to make for an excellent Star Wars shooter via patches and DLC that was pretty incredible. Every expansion that came out for that game was seemingly better than the last. The mm -hmm. amount of content that it added in, all of the tie-ins to The Last Jedi and later on The Rise of Skywalker and Rogue One, all of that. Oh no, Rogue One was the original Battlefront, I think. But the point is, yes. the DLCs were great. And then, just as the game, in my opinion, was really reaching its peak, was really, you know, dropping content after content that was incredible, it was announced that the support for the game was being stopped because EA needed all of its teams to focus on the next Battlefield game. And as we know, the next Battlefield game was Battlefield 2042, which in itself had a disastrous launch. 2042 so like problems. 2042 problems, hey. yeah. You were absolutely spot on there. <laughs> and that's coming from someone who liked the launch version of 2042. <laughs> but the point is, they've essentially sacrificed what was a great growing game in favor of one that, you know, did not do anything to move the needle, didn't do any favors to EA's reputation, mm. or the Battlefield franchise franchise's reputation, and since then we've had two or three years of support for that game, trying to fix it in the same way that they did for Battlefront 2. Mm -hmm. But the biggest shame, I think, is that support for Battlefront 2 ended right when Star Wars was really diversifying its content. And while I might not be the biggest fan of the bevy of TV shows that that franchise has released in the years since, I do admit that those TV shows would have made for bloody good DLC. The yeah. fact that we never got any Mandalorian content for Battlefront 2 is kind kind of crazy mm -hmm. because um, support ended just as the first season was coming out in the UK. It had already released in the US, but it hadn't released um, globally at mm -hmm. that point, as far as I'm aware. And I just think, like, why? There was so much potential left in Battlefront 2, mm -hmm. and now we have no Star Wars online game like it. You know, the fact that that isn't still supported and we probably won't see a Battlefront 3 for years, if ever, because that was apparently canceled as well. It's just, it's a major shame. Yeah, and the thing is, I ended up buying, because I bought Battlefront 2 back at launch, and like you said, it was the, everyone remembers Battlefront 2. It was like a horrible thing. They had to gut a bunch of microtransactions out of it. They, it took them ages to put relevant content back into it and make it play better and everything else. But I got the complete edition in the end, and that is by far, 
like I was gonna say the best Star Wars game ever. Like Ooh. if you think about like fan service and the amount of different um, locations you can go to, how well it plays, how well it's rendered, the breadth of um, environments that are all in there, ranging from the Clone Wars to the original trilogy and everything. It's just all in there by the end. But I feel like the general conversation on Battlefront had already moved away onto like, oh, that game's broken, that game has microtransactions, whatever it does. And the complete edition um, is the best thing about it. And that's what you could have then supported going forward and yeah. um, to have it just be the platform. It could have been their Destiny 2 or something. And it's just a shame <laughs> that they um, threw that away because if you get Battlefront 2 now, it's phenomenal. It's just that it took this long um, or a good few years to get to that point. Yep, you speak in my language, Scott Tilford. I just think it's quite a shame that you have games that manage to turn things around from their initial reception, like Destiny, like No Man's Sky, like Cyberpunk, like mm. even Battlefield Five. You know, you've got all of these titles that succeeded after a rocky launch and went on to years and years of support and great content drop after great content drop. And Battlefront 2 genuinely could have been the best of the bunch, but yeah. it was cut short, and what a shame it was.